Monaco, it must be said, is a Grand Prix like no other. It has become the most prestigious of all Grand Prix's and yet is completely untypical. The presence of the world's most sophisticatedly technological cars in this pocket handkerchief sized Mediterranean principality might seem apt. After all, many of the inhabitants are the elite of their world too. Yet it is a crazy anachronism, for here you have the extreme contrast between the roar and fury of Formula One on one hand, the smart kitsch of the environment on the other, and together they form a surrealist cocktail with an unrivaled taste. Every Ascension Week, Monaco in Grand Prix Week becomes the place to be, one of the great sporting and social occasions of the world. was conceived by its innovator, creator, Anthony Noges in the 20s. The circuit would not just be made up of city streets, but also roads along the port, climbing up to the casino its highest point before descending to the sea again. Its extreme narrowness and the tortuous character of its route favoured agility over power. Not surprisingly then, it was a Bugatti driven by Williams which won the inaugural event in 1929. More surprisingly, however, is the fact that this non-permanent circuit has survived and is today the second oldest of all Grand Prix circuits. Entre 29 et 92, sur le même endroit, dans une ville qui n'a pas beaucoup changé, qui a changé certainement dans son architecture, la largeur des rues étant demeurée à peu près constante, nous avons quand même réussi à adapter, si je puis dire, à nous adapter plus exactement à l'évolution technique de ces voitures. Against all the odds, the organizers have managed to preserve their circuit, in spite of the considerable changes that affected not only the cars, but also their environment and outlooks over the last 60 years. Over the years, while nearly all the great traditional circuits have either been forsaken or changed beyond recognition, Monaco, in spite of one or two upheavals and coping with natural changes, has somehow held its place. The first fixed barriers, still only one layer, appeared in the early 60s. It was the start of a program which would slowly establish the pattern for all street circuits in terms of facilities, safety and the need to adapt the track as the cars got quicker. The pits moved, the quayside section was widened thanks to influence used on the port and the track modified by encircling the swimming pool constructed in 1976. However, the basic nature of the circuit would never change. Some would complain in the hope of updating facilities, but most people were pleased that the circuit upheld tradition, even though it didn't really allow drivers to exploit the full potential of their racing cars. For their Grand Prix to remain a round of the Formula One World Championship, the organizers have to work miracles. For Grand Prix week, they have to erect 30 kilometers of barrier held together by 100,000 bolts. Point de vue montage, euh, nos systèmes sont parfaitement informatisés et en 25 jours ouvrables, nous arrivons à tout mettre en œuvre et il faut 15 jours pour démonter. Et puis il y a la période euh, dite de combat, c'est-à-dire c'est la mobilisation. La mobilisation, c'est quand même euh, 600 commissaires. C'est à peu près 150 sapeurs-pompiers, 45 médecins réanimateurs, 100 médecins, euh, médecins généralistes, c'est quatre compagnies de CRS, c'est toute la sûreté monégasque, plus de 500 hommes au travail, ce sont les carabiniers. C'est une, une organisation qui fait à peu près 2500 à 3000 personnes. La préparation d'une telle manifestation euh, prend évidemment l'année et c'est un budget d'environ 60 millions de francs. This tight organization has to be well run. That's why every car that stops on the circuit can be removed from the track almost immediately via seven critical points on the circuit by teams that are highly trained and watched by the race directors on a closed circuit TV system that covers the whole circuit. 
that's not counting a team of track marshals who are as competent as they are committed to the job, which isn't always the case. It's thanks to the huge methodical effort that is made that the Monaco Grand Prix is still run on its original site and has become a myth. But the myth has also been based on the social character of the race, adopted by the world's jet set. For me it's a big mess, because I've never ever seen a panopticum of people environment like in Monte Carlo, because here you see everybody nearly abnormal, you don't see anybody normal, which is the fun about Monte Carlo, and it's good to come here for a weekend, enjoy yourself and then go, but then be normal again, which I think is the most important thing. For a long time, the Monaco Grand Prix was the excuse and stage for a dazzling selection of stars, mainly from the world of show business. They were attracted by the irresistible thought of rubbing shoulders, not only with princes of the track, but real ones too. When Jackie Stewart talked of a Hollywood production, he wasn't joking. Recently, however, the stars have been chased out of the pits and are now rare, but the pretty girls who tremble at the slightest glimpse of a racing driver still clamour to be close to their idols. And the streets of the Principality become a sort of open-air motor show, except that usually more than one of each of the most beautiful and expensive cars in the world are on show. Meanwhile, down in the port, the most sumptuous yachts in the Mediterranean are crammed together like mere sardines. And while at many other circuits the drivers are shut up in their hotels, invisible outside working hours, at Monaco they are prepared to enjoy a little social life. point of view it was too busy a weekend too many things to do too many cocktail parties too many dinners too many autographs and sometimes too many practices too early in the day yes this circuit more than any other demands absolute concentration because the visibility is very poor and corners follow one another without respite they have famous names the rascas san devot casino square and each year, Formula One builds on the legend that is Monaco. This narrow, twisty ribbon of tarmac, lined by two rows of unforgiving steel barrier, doesn't allow a single moment's distraction, nor a single deviation from the racing line. The whole circuit is exciting because it does, you have no room for any mistakes. As soon as you lose concentration for 1%, you will crash. So it's a very hard, hard circuit to drive on and to win on. Right from the start, the funnel into San Devot often causes spectacular accidents. The narrowness of the streets makes any overtaking maneuver extremely hazardous and causes rush hour style traffic jams. Generally harmless accidents can still be frightening. Tambe survived Mirabeau and San Devot was watching over Patrese. A little Latin influence saw De Cesaris and Monaco resident Piquet arguing like Rome taxi drivers when they interlocked wheels at Lowe's hairpin. But you don't need help to put a foot wrong in Monaco, as Berger experienced at the swimming pool. Being one of the toughest races on the calendar, it's no surprise that an uncommon number of incidents have taken place here. In 1984, for instance, Mansell lost the lead, losing control on the white line. However, while accidents may be frequent, they are rarely serious, because the car's speed they subsequently reviewed their entire system. Amongst the drivers, Monaco generates passionate controversy between traditionalists and realists. C'est un circuit qui est complètement anachronique, bon, par rapport au, à la compétitivité des voitures, par rapport à leur performance, surtout aujourd'hui. C'est un, un circuit qui est complètement dépassé. On arrive à organiser là-bas parce que, d'abord, les gens sont très compétents, les commissaires sont très très efficaces. Donc, on arrive à avoir quand même une sécurité en dehors du circuit qui est bonne. 
Maintenant, euh, c'est assez incroyable, assez impressionnant de conduire une voiture de 700 chevaux dans les, dans les rues de Monaco. On arrive quand même à avoir un certain plaisir. Il y a le passage de la bosse du, du casino qui est très impressionnant, où là, on, on voit les spectateurs qui arrivent vraiment... Euh, c'est comme s'ils s'avançaient sur, sur nous. Le passage du tunnel, qui est là aussi incroyable. Si on s'arrête en dehors du, du tunnel et qu'on voit les voitures passer, c'est un des endroits peut-être les plus impressionnants de la, de la saison. The swimming pool area is very exciting. The first part, the first part when you come after the chicane, you accelerate, and then when you come left there and all the way, that's very exciting because it's very, it's danger, very danger, no room for anything, and, and you go so fast there, so close to the wall. If you touch the wall, you go against the other wall immediately. It's, it's, it's very difficult to commit yourself to drive quick through there. And it's a place where you can make or you can lose a lot of time. È un circuito, non è come altri circuiti cittadini che abbiamo avuto in passato dove le curve erano delle 90 gradi e frenata e accelerazione. Qui abbiamo delle curve come la curva del Casino la curva del, cabac, del tabaccaio, la curva del Mirabeau, che sono tutte, tutte curve che hanno un, delle caratteristiche ben precise che si avvicinano moltissimo a un circuito permanente. Contested and detested, that's Monaco. But this Grand Prix is still the one that everyone wants to win, simply because it has no equal. It's a monument to motorsport, a classic, which has been won by some of the greatest drivers in the history of the sport since the 30s. Sterling Moss won some of his greatest races at Monaco. This is Formula One's top of the market shop window. Its glamorous side fascinates the public and stimulates drivers, however successful and blase they may be. From my point of view, it was the most exciting Grand Prix in the year to win. It was the most prestigious because everybody came there. The motor industry came, all of the sponsors came, all of the corporations who were associated with motor racing came and used it. There's another specific factor which contributes to make this race different. In the confined space of the Principality, the gladiators are closer to the spectators than anywhere else. On a track where it's almost impossible to overtake, grid positions take on a new importance in comparison to other circuits, and the battle for pole takes on a new significance. Qualifying is a, a real sprint there, more than any other circuit. It's a tremendous sprint. Uh, and in sometimes it takes so much energy, so much concentration that you, you really see nothing else other than the narrow road, the arm goes in the walls and your wheels because you you positioning your wheels with the arm go all the time. And five times out of nine, Senna has succeeded. He is a prince of the Monaco circuit. Needless to say, on this very tight and demanding track, there have been many extraordinary races with many remarkable drives. The most gracious, without doubt, took place in 1932, when the great Caracciola, having taken the lead from Nuvolari, who was having trouble with his engine, let him overtake again just before the finish. He didn't want to profit from the problems suffered by a rival who, in his eyes, deserved to win. The most unlucky yet worthy driver at Monaco was surely Jim Clark, who never managed to add victory in the Principality to his long list of wins, in spite of frequently looking as though he might, only to break down. Graham Hill, however, was for a long time the most successful driver at Monaco, where he won five times. One of his victories was in 1965, when he kept everyone on tenterhooks. hooks. 
leading on the 25th lap, he had to take to the escape road after a back marker blocked the entrance to the chicane. But with typical stolid British spirit and tenacity, he restarted over a half a minute behind, catching his rivals one after another. And taking his third consecutive victory in the Principality. The most unexpected ending to a Monaco Grand Prix was in the 1970 event. Brabham had dominated, but then eased up too much too early. Rint, in second place, was well charged up, and seeing the gap between himself and Brabham dropping, went for an all-out final sprint. And the unexpected happened. Held up by a slower driver in the last corner, the Australian spun out, and that's how the race director, checkered flag in hand, saw Rint coming rather than Brabham, and was so surprised that he missed him. The 1982 event was almost as unexpected in the final laps. Riccardo Patrese, who would be the winner, still didn't believe it ten years later when he told us the story. La gara dell'82 è stata abbastanza sorprendente per come è finita dopo aver fatto tutta la gara in seconda posizione dietro a Prost. Ha cominciato a piovere a due giri dalla fine e, e Alain si è girato alla chicane. Io sono passato in testa e pur cercando di andare pianissimo mi sono girato anch'io al tornante dell'Ors all'ultimo giro. Nel momento in cui mi sono girato ho visto sfilare eh, due o tre macchine. Eh, alla fine del, de, di quel giro si sono fermati sia Pironi che De Cesaris, però dentro la mia testa ero convinto che ancora Rosberg fosse eh, davanti a me, quindi di aver finito il Gran Premio in seconda posizione. Invece la macchina che avevo visto, la Williams che avevo visto passarmi vicino era quella di Daly che era doppiata. E mi sono ritrovato primo senza neanche saperlo perché dentro la mia testa pensavo di essere arrivato secondo e quindi me l'hanno comunicato solo nel momento in cui mi hanno mandato davanti al palco dei principi. Il secondo corso è Didier Pironi, deuxième della corsa Pironi, troisième Andrea De Cesaris, alla quatrième place Nigel Manson, alla But it was perhaps the 1988 event which best demonstrated the specific, pitiless nature of this incomparable Grand Prix. Prost made a bad start and found himself blocked by Berger, allowing Senna to pull out a lead of about a minute. When the Frenchman finally moved up to second, Senna at first allowed him to close up. But suddenly he panicked, forced the pace and made an elementary mistake, losing control of his McLaren and hitting the barrier at Portier, when he had the race won. I changed a lot my strategy from that day on as far as driving was concerned and uh, it was just a consequence of the mistake I had in 88. It was a, a difficult day, not such a good result, but a necessary result perhaps that gave me so much success after it. Such lessons are profitable for those who have the intelligence to learn from them. In 1992, Senna proved that he was one of those. Even though he realized that Mansell and his Williams-Renault were the superior combination on the track, he showed that he wouldn't be happy to finish second, as he wouldn't on any other circuit, and his policy was rewarded when his rival had to stop to change tires. This archery at Monaco, equaling the famous record established by Graham Hill in the 60s. Senna's first win was in 1987, driving his Honda-powered Lotus, the same engine powering him to his four consecutive victories between 89 and 92. With remarkable concentration, exceptional judgment and unerring precision, Senna used all these qualities to master this very demanding race circuit. And it meant that he, too, could join Graham Hill as a Prince of Monaco. 
The mustachioed Englishman probably didn't have the same brilliance as Senna, but he had no equal when it came to maintaining the extraordinary rhythm required to drive around this unforgiving circuit. Prost also is a master of it, as borne out by his four victories between 84 and 88. Here, the professor could put his exceptional race strategy into practice. Sterling Moss's three wins were three of the best of his career, profiting from his exceptional talent and the very tricky track to outclass rivals in cars that were more powerful than his own. Jackie Stewart had similar talents to Prost's and, like Moss, won three times at Monaco. As he admits, they were three victories of which he is most proud and which were his more glorious. It has its critics, but certainly no other Grand Prix equals the prestige of Monaco. If I had to say that my fairy godmother was going to give me one more opportunity to drive in a race and win it, I would say it'd have to be Monaco. In the 90s, there is probably no place on earth less suitable for organising a Grand Prix than the Principality of Monaco. But even so, there is nowhere else on no other circuit that the noise and the sheer fury of these super-powered single-seaters is quite so awesome as on its streets. Formula One may change, but conversely and in spite of everything, the magic is still there. It is utterly unique and without the help of Hollywood. At the turn of the century, the motor car's development mainly concerned speed. Scarcely had man developed petrol-driven cars than he began to race them. In those heroic old days, it wasn't a sport that was money-orientated. Early racing drivers were gentlemen fascinated by technical progress and amateur sportsmen who liked to take risks, like the famously bearded aristocrat René de Knif or the Count of Chasnouloba. Or else they were pioneers of the motor industry, eager to show off the capabilities of their products, such as the Renault brothers, Fritz von Opel, Emile Lavasseur, the Dion and Bouton, the Michelin brothers, and later Vincenzo Lancia.
It was the elite Automobile Club de France which eventually turned the sport into an international confrontation. Teams came from manufacturers, the cars driven by their employees, who worked as mechanics, engineers or test drivers during the week and became racing drivers on Sundays. Thus began Enzo Ferrari's career at Alfa Romeo. The racing motorist earned prize money and wages, but racing at this time was simply a way of improving an employee's status while satisfying his will to race. The Grand Prix driver of the first two decades was more like a sort of motorized Ben-Hur, who risked his life in this dangerous sport for the greater glory of his country and employer, rather than to make his fortune. These early racing motorists also went in search of records. In 1929, Henry Seagrave reached 230 MPH driving Golden Arrow for the honor of his country. Gradually, however, motor racing was moving from the open road to closed circuits. Thus, it became a spectacle in its own right, and the driving aces vied with jockeys and boxers as heroic sportsmen of a golden age. Professionals entered the scene, and the manufacturers fought for their services, although not with very high wages. The stars of the 30s, however, were still risking their lives by racing, and their reward was more often an accident than wealth. Few of them, however, made their living by racing, and Grand Prix fields were completed largely by wealthy amateurs. We had already reached the era of gentlemen drivers and professionals. It was the same in record-breaking. The gentlemen drivers, Sir Malcolm Campbell and then John Cobb, both broke the 500 kph barrier in 1938. In Grand Prix racing, it was the organizers who ran the show. Entrants were invited to race, but a turning point came in 1950 with the creation of a Formula One World Championship, where competitors were invited to participate in a series of events. This process didn't guarantee a fee, and it didn't overcome haggling over money. In fact, the organizers allotted each competitor start money, which varied depending on the driver's fame, plus a contribution to traveling expenses, each entrant receiving his own fee, or as good a fee as he could bargain for. Of course, it was the big teams, such as Alfa Romeo and Mercedes, who profited most from this arrangement, even though they weren't racing for the money. The little teams, mainly British in the early 50s, who made up the bulk of the field, had to make do with what was left. This was particularly meagre, as the unprofessional organizers played upon the budgetary difficulties which made them look mean. Thus was born the practice of running start money specials, a team would run two cars. The most competitive would be for the number one driver, while the second car was only intended to do a few laps in order to earn its start money. That, however, plus contracts signed with fuel companies and automobile equipment manufacturers, constituted the only earnings for a team right up to the end of the 60s. With the exception of one or two of the more affluent of teams, most had trouble balancing their budgets. At the beginning of the 70s, an English entrepreneur, Bernie Eccleston, came on the scene. Having bought the Brabham team, he then suggested to his fellow team owners that they should get together to present a unified front to the organizers. Thus was born the Formula One Constructors Association, or FOCA, which would make its members their fortune by putting the Grand Prix house in order. You just need to be competing for one year and shown to be doing a sensible job and apply for membership. And there's no particular advantage in being a member of FOCA. All the teams get the same benefits financially. It's just, it's an old, the club that's been going a long time. And, you know, we try to steer and hopefully between us when we meet, we do something which we think is not good for each individual. And we don't make politics for each individual team. We try to do something that's good for Formula One racing. Out of the limelight, the 70s were notable for the irresistible rise in power of Fokker, 
who, having knocked the organisers into shape, would now replace them as being the most influential body in Grand Prix racing. As the governing body was badly structured and without any apparent authority, Foca, efficient and active, began to take a bigger and bigger slice of the Grand Prix cake, gradually taking control of Formula One. However, the election of a president determined to exercise his power as head of the governing body, FISA, changed everything. Le sport automobile international se trouvait sous la tutelle d'une commission de la Fédération internationale automobile. J'ai été nommé en 1976 vice-président de la commission sportive internationale. Et j'ai découvert très vite, en quelques mois, qu'elle était sous le contrôle de lobbies de constructeurs, sous certaines influences, euh, germaniques notamment à l'époque, qui faussaient les règlements, qui euh, mettaient en place des règlements dans l'intérêt de certains constructeurs de certains pays. J'ai marqué ma désapprobation en démissionnant bruyamment de ma vice-présidence internationale. Et c'est ainsi qu'à Melbourne, à l'Assemblée Générale de la FIA, nous avons créé la FISA, la Fédération Internationale du Sport Automobile, qui a bénéficié d'un statut d'autonomie à l'intérieur de la FIA. Balestre wanted to assert his authority and put down FOCA. From that moment on, conflict was inevitable. Tout le contrôle du championnat de Formule 1 était entre les mains de M. Gleason et de la FOCA. Pourquoi À cause du vide de l'autorité sportive internationale, à cause de l'absence de pouvoir sportif international. Et le conflit, la grande guerre qui est intervenue dans les années 81-82 entre la FISA et la FOCA, c'est parce que nous avons exigé la reprise en main par nous-mêmes du pouvoir et de l'autorité. We wanted a governing body that would govern the sport because we were becoming, if you like, commercial. We were the, the, the right in the rules. We were our own judge and jury and everything else, and it was extremely difficult. So, and then the the, the president was a little ambitious, and he thought perhaps he should look after the commercial side as well as the sport, in which we didn't think was right. Tension mounted and the first confrontation erupted in 1980. Renault, Ferrari and Alfa Romeo had begun to use turbocharged engines, but the Fokker teams, mainly British, were still using the much cheaper, normally aspirated Ford Cosworth engines. But the latter were less competitive than the turbos. The Fokker teams wanted to ban the turbos, whose supporters had FISA on their side. In order to compensate for the relative lack of power, the Cosworth users used their chassis expertise to discover ground effect, which they were the first to master. But the drivers were alarmed by the physical effects of this phenomena, which so increased grip and therefore cornering speeds, and put pressure on FISA, who banned the sliding skirts, which were so... Big constructors were Renault and Ferrari could see that if they sided in with the Federation, they may get the rules written to suit them. If you remember, it was the time of the turbo coming in and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for an edge in the rules to suit them. So mm -hmm. that if we side in with the Federation, we're going to get the rules written against those terrible English people. <laughs> Defying FISA, FOCA announced their intention to create a breakaway championship. And to prove that this was no idle threat, they organized their first race in South Africa at the start of the 1981 season, and all their teams duly attended. Balest was furious. He wanted revenge. Formula One, however, was threatened by a split which could only be harmful. So Renault, Ferrari and Alfa Romeo deserted FIS as president and negotiated a compromise. After all, they needed respected competitors if their participation was to be credible. Balest was beaten. Goodbye to his dream of total control. Lexton, ça a duré cinq minutes d'ailleurs. Euh, nous avons euh, établi un gentleman's agreement, bon, euh, qui respecte euh, les positions de chaque partie, c'est-à-dire la partie commerciale était pour lui et pour et pour euh, les constructeurs, les pilotes, etc. Et les organisateurs, bien sûr. Et l'aspect sportif euh, avec euh, des redevances normales sous le contrôle de la Fédération Internationale. Et c'est un document qui s'appelle l'accord Concorde, que nous avons mis au point avec euh, huit juristes de trois nationalités dans nos bureaux. Euh, les négociations ont duré 29 jours. 29 jours non-stop. Ce document, d'ailleurs, a résisté à l'épreuve du temps, puisque maintenant, il existe depuis 11 ans, et ça a toujours été la Bible, l'évangile du championnat du monde de Formule 1. 
faces were saved, but the two protagonists had their memories and ambitions of leadership. Even so, the affair brought together Eccleston and Balestre, who learned to his cost that the so-called legalists or manufacturers weren't quite as loyal as he had hoped. So while the Foca teams allegedly interpreted rules such as the minimum weight somewhat loosely, FISA, strangely lax, turned a blind eye. Exasperated, the legalists reacted by lodging protests after the 1982 Brazilian Grand Prix. Winner Piquet and second-placed Rosberg were disqualified, which stirred the whole thing up again. Nearly all the British teams objected to this decision and boycotted the subsequent San Marino Grand Prix. Renault and Ferrari were reduced to arranging a sham of a race in order to save face in front of the public. Each side seemed intent on killing the goose that laid the golden egg and Formula One was going with it. It was the eminent Commendatore Ferrari, Formula One's own conscience, who would save the day. Thanks to his intervention and adjudication, the reconciliation was officially signed and sealed on his home ground at Marinello. This time, all interested parties were in agreement to make the 80s Formula One's golden age, although this would surely not be free. What was at stake was just as vital as the former adversary's previous argument. Since 1968 and the appearance of sponsors on racing cars, Grand Prix had become big business. Cigarette manufacturers and alcoholic drinks producers in particular were banned from advertising in other sports, but found themselves being offered an open international market in motorsport in general and Formula One in particular. Visa, FOCA, legalists and the rest all decided to pull together as one and reap the benefits. Only Ferrari refused to turn his thoroughbreds into cigarette packets but he did allow one company to advertise discreetly on his cars in exchange for paying his driver's salaries worth millions of dollars. At the same time, associated automobile manufacturers that had been traditionally involved with the teams wanted to become more and more involved. So the extent of that competition increased considerably. In the tyre sector, for instance, Dunlop had enjoyed a monopoly at the end of the 60s, but then American companies decided that they wanted to become involved in 1964 in order to promote their product in Europe. What was virtually an auction followed, with financial support going to the bigger teams and resulting in the withdrawal of Dunlop from Formula One. Michelin took up the challenge on behalf of Europe against Goodyear, the American giant, but then quit in 1984. Pirelli came in, but spasmodically and consequently with little success. When they quit, Goodyear was the sole supplier at the start of the 90s. Competition in the tyre supply resulted in considerable technological development, which in turn helped to make Formula One cars even faster. At the same time, however, it also meant that teams' tyre costs went up, and this was even further aggravated in the 80s by the use of soft compound tyres, which would be used in qualifying and last just for one lap. This apparently pointless course of action was at first limited and then abandoned altogether, thanks to Goodyear's monopoly. We bring 2,300 to 2,400 tires to each racetrack. Depending on the rain, how well the qualifiers work, we'll use maybe 1,000 or 1,200 of them. We actually make about 30,000 racing tires for Formula One for the races and for the testing. A lot of testing, as you well know, going on. We don't like to talk money, but it talks many, many millions of dollars, just Formula One. This increase in the cost of competition had two different consequences. One was positive in that the larger teams weren't only supplied with free tires, but were subsidized as well. But on the other hand, the downside was that the rest of the field had to spend an ever larger proportion of their already meager budget on buying tires. The increase in interest in competing came from two different fronts. 
there were the media benefits for media interest in Grand Prix racing had grown considerably since the end of the 70s. And trade sponsors were also interested in using Formula One as a proving ground, which speeded up research and product development. We get a lot of benefits from Formula One. One of them, of course, is to is promote Goodyear and promote our racing image, our performance image. But certainly we do a lot of training, a lot of engineering development, uh, different fabrics, different materials and tires. And it's, it's a lot of good reasons for being here. Technology developed in racing without doubt contributed to the development of production tires. The lowering of profiles, widening of tread patterns, development of a radial carcass, rain patterns, etc. For a long time, the fuel company's role in Formula One was limited to that of part sponsors rather than technological partners, as only pump fuel could be used. But all that changed with the introduction of turbocharged engines at the end of the 70s. The specific problems of combustion which came with the use of these engines led to pressure being brought to bear on the fuel companies to supply sophisticated mixes of fuel which were specifically brewed for these engines. The banning of turbos at the end of the 80s changed little. Research continued, if not increased, in order to get the best out of the normally aspirated engines of the 90s. Depuis le retour de Renault Sport avec le moteur atmosphérique de F1, nous avons développé plus de 300 formulations de carburants spéciaux au sein du centre de recherche de Solèze. Une cinquantaine ont été sélectionnées pour être directement expérimentées sur le moteur de F1. Depuis le début de la saison 91, c'est deux à quatre carburants spécifiques que nous emmenons à chaque Grand Prix et c'est plus d'une vingtaine qui ont été expérimentés et utilisés sur le moteur de F1, aussi bien au banc que sur la piste. The extraordinarily high revving engines powering the Formula One cars of the 90s demanded ultra sophisticated fuel because the development of one went hand in hand with the other. But unlike the tyre situation, which became a monopoly, fuel companies vied with one another for supremacy in an increasingly competitive field where the products contributed considerably to an engine's power. The downside was that it was yet another money-gobbling situation, one more to add to the inflationary spiral to which Formula One was so vulnerable in the 80s and 90s. There was obviously a need to put a break on this super sophisticated research which unfortunately was fatally threatening to the sport simply because it was so costly. But the fuel companies didn't want to relinquish their hard fought position as important technical partners. Chi vuole interpretare la Formula 1 come un laboratorio sperimentale dove è libero fare la ricerca scientifica la più avanzata. It has to be said that the reason why major companies wanted to invest greater and greater sums in Formula One was because that since the 70s, it had become one of the major media sports in the world, guaranteeing sponsors tremendous coverage. Bernie Eccleston was the first to recognize the benefits, ensuring that Grand Prix would become media shows, which would in turn reward the performers. In the 10 years between 1981 and 1991, the television viewing figures for the World Championship multiplied by five, approaching 300 million, according to Foker, who sold the rights to nearly 100 countries. And that explains why the earnings of teams and drivers could be multiplied by 10. The money which is put into Formula One is not put in for nothing. I mean, sponsors only are here to pay the money if they at least get the double back. I mean, nobody is stupid, especially in today's uh, times. I think really Bernie did a fantastic job of keeping it all the time interesting, inventing new races in new countries to keep a consistently growth in Formula One. And the growth in Formula One means more media, more public, more spectators. That means more money put in and more sport and more interesting things come out. And it's amazing how Formula One develops. The only bad thing about Formula One, in my opinion, is that it is so good that it destroys the rest of motorsport. How much is a Grand Prix worth? and how are the earnings shared out. Each promoter pays out a fee to Foker to hold a Grand Prix, understood to be between a million and a million and a half dollars. 
This money is shared out to the teams on a strict sliding scale based on qualifying times, positions during and at the end of the race, and status in the Constructors' Championship. Let's take, for example, the case of the Cannon Williams team in the 1992 Brazilian Grand Prix, where the team's drivers were first and second on the grid and finished in the same positions in the race, and the team led the Constructors' Championship. That performance earned them around $250,000 to $300,000, Add to that a share of the TV rights, most of which is bestowed by FISA to FOCA and sponsors' fees. Under these conditions, it's no surprise that inflation has broken out like a rash in Formula One and no one is entirely happy with it. And with the general adoption of carbon fibre, prices of monocoques have multiplied by 10. Each one costs £80,000, a total of around £500,000 for the season added to which is £15,000 for a nose or a wing, £2,500 for a set of brake discs and pads, £5,000 for a clutch. But the advent of the electronic era has also caused prices to rise with the appearance of telemetry and the development of ultra-sophisticated engineering systems such as active suspension, semi-automatic gearboxes, fly-by-wire acceleration and traction control. Only the top three or four teams can possibly keep up thanks to budgets of 20 to 30 million, yet they don't pay for their works engines nor their drivers paid for by sponsors but the rest are hard pushed enough to get together the budget needed even to be amongst the 26 most competitive cars in the field, for it's so easy to slip into the role of an also-ran. They may only feed on crumbs, fortunately the meal itself is so rich. But that's how the paying driver system has come about. During the off-season, drivers complete with attendant sponsors search frantically for the best drive that they can buy with that sponsor's help. Some drivers bring the budget with them, although not always in direct proportion to their talent behind the wheel. It's a chase as frenetic as that on the track during the rest of the year. The sport and its stars are rich. But, as with anything where large sums of money are involved, however, there is greed, battles for control, conflicts of interest and political manoeuvring. The actual sport begins to take second place. However, the flow of money that followed the huge sums spent by the tobacco companies began to dry up in the recession of the early 90s. Several teams went by the wayside. The top teams, however, had been introducing high-tech aids that began to take the emphasis away from the driver. There became a division between the haves with large budgets and the have-nots with substantially smaller ones. FISA and FOCA saw the need to cut costs to bring the sport back within the monetary reach of the smaller teams, but the team owners couldn't agree on how. However, cutting back technology wasn't necessarily the answer, for this was the attraction of the sport for many, particularly the major automobile manufacturers and trade associates. In the early 90s, this was the dilemma facing the sport. Le sport automobile, vous savez, il fait partie de la civilisation actuelle, c'est une civilisation automobile. Alors, le sport automobile trouvera toujours euh, une solution de remplacement. Il existe depuis 90 ans, le sport automobile. Je crois qu'il va continuer encore un certain temps. <musique>